So welcome back. Thanks for coming back, if, even if you had a shorter break. Uh, in this session, we are going to have two presentations for the Eric Pass Prize Award. Uh, you know that the Eric Pass Prize was created or constituted in 1998 in, to, in the memory of one of our colleagues, Eric Pass, for his contribution in the area of activities, travel pattern analysis, travel demand modeling, and forecasting. He contributed in many other areas, but this is the major one. And uh, since then, in 1998, every year, we, the association, give a prize for uh, the best PhD dissertation based on originality and innovation, quality of the research, the scope that has to combine theory analysis, innovative, innovative data collection, uh, policy application, and critical methodolo methodological reflection. And typically, we, there is uh, one winner and uh, honorable mention. So today, we are going to hear the uh, presentation of the Eric Pass Prize of uh, two years, because uh, the prize is given every year, but we only have the opportunity to listen from the winners uh, at the ITBR. Uh, one of the winners is not here, so I'm, we only have uh, two of this presentation, as you saw yesterday. Uh, before starting, because one of the honorable mention of this year, Feras El Zawi is here, so please, if you want to come, I can give you the certificate in person. <laughs> And now um, we have the uh, 2015 Eric Pass Prize awarded to Michael Manes from University of Maryland. Uh, the title of his dissertation is Choice Modeling Perspective on Social Networks, Social Influence, and Social Capital in Activity and Travel Behavior. Welcome. Uh, oh, you can hear me, good, okay. Um, so I'm Michael Manis, I uh, went to the University of Maryland, I actually was there for 11 years, because uh, I did all four of my degrees there. Um, I'm a student of Chinsia Chirillo, uh, and I just finished my dissertation in April 2015. Um, okay, so uh, this might not be traditional, but I'm gonna start my presentation with someone else's dissertation. Uh, but, um, so essentially, what I was interested in is how could social networks be used in travel demand models, or, but mostly just the components was what I was looking into. Um, but maybe at some point um, we can get to a place where we look at networks and networks actually are a part of creating the population that populates our travel demand model. Okay. So um, I get your attention for about, probably about five minutes. So if anything, this is the slide to remember. So social networks, are about context. Um, so here, these are people at work. So you, you know, you see them in person, you send them emails, you communicate with them. Uh, maybe you have a, a group of golf buddies um, and you go out and, and golf with them. Um, also the people on your, in your cell phone, you're connected to them because you, you have phone. I mean, you, know, you can call them, right? So these are, these are a type of network. Um, just the people you are interacting with on the street like you may not personally know them, but you are around them in, in certain contexts, this is a social network as well. Um, and then what, usually when I say I do social network work, people think I'm talking about Facebook, but that's a, social media is, is a social network as well. Okay. Uh, so I'm gonna start with kind of introduction, and then I'm gonna talk about my acknowledgements. Uh, what did I, well, actually, this is not quite right, but I'm gonna talk about social influence my social influence work, then tips, and then I'll do um, my social, no, social influence is last, social capital is before that. So. Okay, uh, so this is um, an example of how many activity-based modeling systems work. Um, I forgot to attribute, attribute it though, sorry. Um, so we're gonna skip this, these two parts, right? Um, so tour and trip details, so, uh, this is a picture of Knoxville, Tennessee, where I lived for a year and a half. Um, and I actually used to live in a mall. Um, but let's say I wanted to go out and watch a football game, because Knoxville really likes college football, not, the, the, not American football. Uh, so um, maybe I have friends distributed, um, dispersed across the region. 
um, and uh, maybe I want to go and I want to, maybe I'm here and I go to my friend's place there and we take our, a car to downtown together, or maybe we go separately, but we, I, we organize parts of our trip or our tours based on like we're communicating and coordinating, and coordinating them. Right. Okay. Um, maybe we're talking about daily activity patterns, so this is what I normally do in a day, right? Uh, so here, I leave work, then what do I do? Like I can change depending on, like maybe I go happy hour, so that requires coordination with some of your friends. Maybe you go to your cousin's birthday party, that's your family, then, or maybe I, maybe I really don't want to socialize today, so I'll just go home. Um, then you run your models, and then crying is an activity, right? I think, I think crying is an activity, and then you sleep. So. Uh, you can also, uh, mobility choices, so um, maybe, well, and I'm, bicycling is popular in some areas, but in other areas it's not, so um, maybe the people around you and, net, and your neighbors kind of can encourage, you, encourage or discourage you from riding the bike. So if you see many people in your neighborhood bike, that might tell you like, oh, maybe I'll change my, uh, like my modality style, perhaps. Uh, or if your work colleagues are supportive of you biking, like they don't mind that you, you, know, you might sweat a little bit before you get to work, then that could be a supportive environment. Um, even, but then also even in our long-term choices, we have networks. So maybe um, we're talking about adoption of new vehicles, which require you to gain information about the, the new vehicles, which, require, which usually um, that involves a lot of like your weak ties, um, as well as like getting information from the neighborhood and society in general about what, um, how, the, how do these work, or um, it's, are they safe, are they comfortable? Right. Okay. Um, and then, like, one day, I hope, uh, eventually you make synthetic populations where you have these different networks that are relevant for different parts of an activity-based system, um, and then they are dispersed spatially across a area. Right. Okay. So I generalized uh, social interactions in the four forms. Um, social influence which is uh, where your, the, your actual actions are, are altered by the behavior, be, um, behavior, attitudes, and beliefs of others. Social capital um, is a kind of a catch-all term. It's kind of a catch-all term, but um, it's essentially your networks actually bring value themselves. So they give you access to resources, and they enable you to do things that you, either you wouldn't do normally or, um, or yet you're incapable of doing. You can also cooperate. Right, so like, uh, like I said, um, you could carpool together, right? You could, um, you know, I could go shopping today and you, and uh, maybe my spouse doesn't shop today, um, or I, take, I could take kids to, to, to school, you don't take the kids to school, we go together. Um, and then social learning, which is similar to social influence, but this is more um, you, um, you're using, your you're learning new behaviors and beliefs through actual observation, right, and experience. So you're using other people's experience to help you learn. Um, then the thing that kind of connects them all is that different social networks are relevant for these different tasks. So uh, remember the first, the third slide? So social networks are about context. So uh, the thing, these are different ways of interacting, but all interactions occur over some kind of social network. Uh, in my work, um, I'm pretty much concentrating on these today, so. Um, okay, so we go to acknowledgments. Right. So I didn't want to start with acknowledgments because then you would you would pay attention to the acknowledgments and not 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 what I the vision, right? So uh, I want to thank my parents. Um, uh, so Michael and Helen Manis. Um, so yeah, that's my me graduating. That's good. Uh, I want to thank my advisor. Uh, I've known uh, Chintia since she started at Maryland. So um, she taught my introduction to transportation engineering class. And one day I just asked, like, hey, can I do some research with you? And she said, okay. Uh, I didn't know what she did, but I, was, it, I tried. So, um, so then uh, I graduated and wanted to go and work, but I couldn't find a job, so I came back. Uh, and then I, I kept working with her, and then I was like, oh, well, hey, travel behavior is really cool. I guess I won't do traffic. So, um, and then, so then I stayed six years. Yeah, six years. That's a long time. Okay. Um, then my dissertation committee. Um, so uh, I have an economist, uh, three civil engineers, and uh, she's a sociologist, but also in geography. I think she's, a, she's in the geography department now. Okay. Um, and my committee was really helpful because 
well, particularly they really grilled me on my proposal, so, um, which made the dissertation change quite a bit. Uh, and then um, there are many people in the research community that have helped me throughout my career, but these are the people that were relevant specifically for the dissertation. So other people, sorry, I didn't acknowledge you, but th these people were relevant. Uh, especially Elena, because uh, like, um, so towards the beginning, like I really learned a lot from like talking to her and, um, and like seeing her work and, and bringing so many ideas off of her. Uh, I'd also like to thank the people in my research group um, who have all graduated now, so. Um, and then uh, my friends who are uh, another part of my social network who helped me do things other than, you know, run models and cry. And then uh, with prize committee and reviewers who I don't know who they are, but you're not, you're not least, you're just last here. That's, that's all. <laughs> okay. Um, so this was the structure of my dissertation. Uh, it had three parts. One was on activity participation and social capital. And then um, I talked about estimation properties, mostly um, small samples, but also some, um, like a there was a practical estimate, um, estimation property exercise. And then I talked about social influence and um, made a latent class model to try to look at that. Um, so I won't bore you with the second part too much, so we'll, we'll just do a couple slides on that. Okay. Uh, so for the second part, what mostly I did was uh, I created these little small networks. These are like 100, about 100 or so people, right? Um, and I wanted to see um, if I have a structure, if I have a model of this structure, uh, um, how much would I reject, how often would I reject my null hypothesis correctly and how often would I not, as well as what's the error in my estimate of delta. But I won't go into that. Okay. So. Uh, the first part was about social capital, uh, and I've done some work since then, since, since my dissertation was 2015, so I'm presenting more some other, some follow-up work, mostly. Um, so in previous work, uh, activity diaries tended to, um, didn't at first ask who you worked with, I mean, who you did activities with. And then they began um, in the 2000s to start asking people like with whom, right? Um, also, uh, activity-based models like to explore intra-household inter cooperation, um, but there's limited theory about like, the social factors that, that contribute to participation in certain activities. So um, uh, there's a lot of stuff on intra-household, intra but not so much uh, like a theory for like why, like, not so, um, I don't think there's much theory about why you do other activities. Um, so by incorporating social capital, um, it does two things. One is um, we can explore how networks bring value by enabling your travel and activities, as well as we can look at uh, how travel and activities allow for the creation of social capital. So how, they, how does it allow you to get access to social resources? Um, there's been some prior work in this, uh, especially like Juan's done quite a bit uh, and has really good data sets for that, as well as um, uh, Ayurif, uh Sadri. He's done some work with like joint trip frequencies and trying to understand um, like how the structure of your networks affect the trips, um, as well as some other work as well on close contacts and beating frequency. Okay. So short terminology. Um, so when I talk about, so traditionally we have ties. We call them ties, or they're also called edges or links, right? Because this is networking terminology, right? Um, and the individuals are like nodes, right? And then you can have ties that are undirected, so this generally means they both can do things in both directions, but also sometimes we talk about ties being directed. Um, most work with social networks and, tr and transportation is with undirected ties, but um, there is some, some people can do work with directed. Okay, so how do we generate uh, ties? So I'm talking about, so how do you connect with another person? Generally, it occurs by three processes. One is social safety. So we like to, um, we like to feel, we want to feel like secure and safe in our, in our interactions. So we tend to pick people who are like us in many ways, as well as uh, people who are close, like in, not only in terms of space, but this can also be close, um, in terms of like communication, you could be close in that way as well. 
Um, then there's brokerage. So we're, as humans, we actually also like to explore. Um, so we like to connect. So some people like to connect. So, so brokerage helps to connect these social circles uh, and these groups. Um, and they also help to transfer influence, knowledge, and also resources because um, not everyone you are close to has everything you need. Um, and then there's also networks are formed by status. And that's where um, people have different power and prestige and can control it. So um, people, try, people may try to get access to people with high status so that um, they can get more resources free. Okay. How does that kind of look? Um, so, so you may have these, these, like these clicks or cliques, right? Um, so these are, tend to be strong ties, right? So you, um, these are people that you're really close to, and these promote social safety. So they tend to be, they tend to be smaller, but the people in them tend to know each other, right? Because you have very, like I said, you have very common interests. Uh, you can have weak ties, and these are done, this is brokerage, right? So there, there could be a few people um, that link these social groups. And then you can also have status. So you could pro possibly have a hierarchy. So this could be, you know, um, your PhD supervisor, these are some postdocs, and these are students. Um, I tried to give an example before and said like, oh, this could be the chair of the department, and I was like, wait, no, that doesn't really, doesn't really happen. Like, he doesn't really, the chair doesn't really have much power. But, okay. So let's uh, talk about theory. Um, I'm not really going to go into this in too much detail. Um, so my idea was to connect, let's go back, to connect these, like why are ties generated and how that might affect your leisure activity. Um, to kind of summarize it, so I, my idea is that, well, um, as the variety of activities that you participate in, like, that should increase as you get more contacts, just because there are more and more people that have information and knowledge about, like, where you can, get, like, activities that you can participate in, as well as the locations for them. But the people that you're close to have very similar interests to you, so they actually, they, I would think that they would contribute less uh, to the variety. Um, but they would probably contribute more to the frequency because you want to because they're close to you, you want to interact. Um, but your weak ties help to broaden your the variety because they link different groups, right? So they link different information about different activities. I'm getting time. So the data set I used for my work um, was from this is from Pew Internet. Um, yeah, it's from Pew Internet. So it was a telephone survey of, the, of US residents, and it included a name generator, a position generator, generator and leisure activity participation. So uh, these are places that they said how often they, they went to that place. Um, so, the, so these are um, tools that can help you measure social capital, um, and then I'll show you what they, what, what they look like. Right? So a name generator, so this kind of helps you find strong ties, so the people, you, you know, the people you're close to. Um, so this is the most popular form of that um, of this um, question type. So this is like mo most people discuss important. From time to time, most people discuss important matters with other people. Looking back over the last six months, who are the people with whom you discuss matters and that are important to you? Right. So um, they gave them this question to ask, like list five people. So you would list um, you would list the five. Right. Uh, and then they also asked another question, like, um, who are the people that are especially significant in your life? Um, the reason they asked both of these is that um, there's some question about whether people will still consider interaction on the internet to be discussions. So they added another question to, to try to see how many people repeated, uh, how many people re repeated. So you could have up, in this data set, you could have up to 10 um, strong ties. So five people from here, and then you could repeat those five, any of those five as well as add another five if you wanted. Um, so the position generator, this is, uh, helps you learn about the weak ties. So it helps you, helps you um, learn um, the spread of resources. That may, it can help you learn the spread of resources they have access to. So this question is just yes, no. Um, do you know somebody on a first name basis for the most part who, who has one of these occupations? Right. Um, but if you notice, this list has people in different status levels in society and prestige, right? So I mean, um, this not a very, prestigious thing right now, but this, uh, but you know, a professor, yeah, very prestigious, right? Yeah, we're, we're good. Um, okay. 
But what you can do with this, right, is uh, you can, well, the simple thing is you can sum up the number of yeses, and that tells you, that gives you an idea of how diverse their weak ties are, right? Uh, you could take, these all had different status levels, and actually in sociology, they've um, ranked these by country, right? They, they've, the, um, they've learned, they've learned uh, with what society, what countries and how, they, how people in, that, in those countries tend to treat, like rank these. So um, they actually all have like a status number. And so you can also look at like um, the average status of the contacts you have, or you can do upper reachability, which would be like um, who has um, the status level of the, of the most prestigious person, uh, most prestigious occupation you have access to in your weak tie network. Uh, so since then, so now I was talking about earlier variety of activities and frequency. So I did two um, regressions uh, looking at, trying to look at, um, this is variety, also did frequency, which has the same form. But you have uh, here, these are your strong ties. So this was the log of the um, number of people you listed in, your, in, the, in the name generator. And then using the position generator, I looked at diversity, so that's the sum of the yeses of occupations. And then prestige was the, I did upper reachability, so the highest prestige level of, uh, that, that you had access to. Um, oh, I took that away. Um, I did correct, I did account for endogeneity with this uh, variable, as well as, um, I know it's a Poisson, and people like negative binomials, but um, Wooldrit says that you can do a Poisson if you're really interested in means. I'm not really interested in predicting, I just wanna see if there's a relationship, so Poisson, okay. So these are some results. Uh, so our hypothesis was that as you get more strong ties, you should have more variety and higher frequency. And those are both positive, but the frequency was insignificant. Uh, the diversity, so how wide your, you have access, how wide your network is, your least network, was positive for both variety and frequency. And then also this upper reachability was also had a positive relationship. Um, and that would make sense because, to some degree, because you would, that people with higher status would probably ha, uh, do more activities or have access to more activities because uh, people are trying to participate, ha, trying to do things with them because they have power. Okay. Uh, these are some estimates. I think um, practically what this means is that there was about compared, so somebody that had zero, a, um, that knew none of the professions in the, in the position generator list compared to somebody that had knew all 22, uh, I think they had three, about three to four times as much variety uh, of activities, and then I think their frequency was like about eight, eight times as much. Uh, these are some uh, individual characteristics. The thing I thought was interesting was mostly that um, it seems like if you are, if you, if you get a partner in some way, you tend to do more stuff and you do more, with more variety. Um, but once you get married, it starts to go down. So the marriage, <laughs> married is the, <laughs> um, but if you're just single without anybody, you definitely don't do much. So, you, so, you, so if you want to do more activities, get a partner, I guess, or, and, or increase your, or change your network. Uh, and these were some build environment stuff, but you can see it, like the survey that I used wasn't really designed to be a travel survey. It was not a, it's not an activity diary. Oh. Um, so there's limited stuff that I could, I get it to. Um, so some results. Uh, this is, uh, I have five minutes, so we'll go past this for now. Um, so this session, mostly I was limited because you, if you saw my list, it was not really an exhaustive list. Um, and also it's not really, it wasn't really a, a travel diary, right? Um, so for future work, I would like to, uh, well, I'll just show you what I'm trying to do for future work. Uh, so. What I want to do is have a more exhaustive activity list. So here is a list of about 82 activities. So, um, and then they're also clustered into different um, psychological needs for, for those um, activity, for the, the activities. Um, so um, then this is a resource generator. But um, so what I would like to do is look, use the position generator again um, and use a more exhaustive list and see, uh, look at the variety and types of activities they participate in in the last month and then uh, you know, see if the, this relationship holds in a more general sense, not in just in, in the case of that um, survey. Um, and then we're gonna ask about AVs, but that's cool. Okay, 
Uh, I got to lead a little fast with this. But so I had tips. OK. Uh, you should listen to your supervisor, but don't listen to your supervisor. Sorry. Uh, you also remember uh, life happens when you're a PhD. So um, that's more or less than for people that go straight to PhD. So, uh, and then uh, take breaks from sitting is really important. So, so that's what, the, 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 if you don't take breaks from sitting, then life happens. So, so. Um, and then also 80-20. So you know, you might want to estimate that joint model, but it's only going to be like two pages in your dissertation. So maybe you just don't do it. So. You know. Um, and then also have tips for if you aspire to be to get an award. So um, you should read other people's dissertations. So you know, like you, uh, if you're an artist, you look at other people's art. If you're a writer, you read other people's work. Um, literature, a, literature, a, lit, a literature review could be good, right? But non-dissertation style. So don't just be like, okay, this is you know, this person did this and this person did this. Like bring bring it together. Right? Um, if you give a proof, it seems to work. I don't know, it worked worked out for me. Um, theming can help, but I think the next presentation will show that you don't necessarily have to have themes. So, um, and then uh, you're probably going to spend more time on a PhD than you like if you want to get an award. So. <laughs> um, and then also, I use my appendix to describe future work, and from the comments I got, they like that. So maybe you could do that. Okay. Um, then I'll go over this really quickly. So I have like two minutes, three minutes. So I also created a model that, uh, of social influence. And this was mostly um, the general idea is like that. Uh, let's go past. Cool. OK. So conformity comes in different types. There's normative, where the behavior of others tell you that this is what you're expected to do in society. And then also, you can also um, look at other people's behavior because you don't quite know what to do. So you're looking to them for guidance. Um, to, to get more information. So, um, so like, let's say when you're first learning how to drive, at first, the normative would be like, you know, everybody drives faster than the speed limit. That's just expected from society. But like the first time I drove in the rain, I drove slower than everybody else around me. And then I was like, okay, I guess I can drive faster because everybody else is driving faster and they are more experienced than me. Okay. So traditionally, how we deal with, how we handle conformity in a discrete choice model is we put it directly in utility. Um, people that have done informational conformity stuff have. Um, this is behavior, like the average behavior. Um, people that do more stuff for information conformity also may put in the information that, they, that the people get from other ties. Um, but what I was interested in was, um, well, what if I get rid of this, but I put this kind of as a, so I make beta a function of your average behavior. So I did it in a latent class structure. Um, and so this information function here is the class membership equation. And that puts you into two classes, more informed or less informed, I called them. Um, and then you have different betas, right, depending on your class. So you have different tastes. So you have taste variation dependent on social influence. Okay. Uh, these are some contributions to, from, from, method, from methodology. Um, I think the most, um, what, I guess the most general contribution would be this last one. So I made a way to deal with if this is an endogenous variable, um, this endogeneity is in the class membership function. So I was like, oh, well, does it actually affect, uh, I mean, it's correlated with this, this uh, epsilon here. So um, I created a way to a uh, control function that, would, that you could put in here um, that would handle the endogeneity. Um, it didn't actually matter. So this is, and then I also created a way to estimate the corrective scale. Because right? actually, when you change it, you have, you're, you have a wrong scale. So, um, but I want to do like equilibrium um, analysis, which requires you to have a good scale, the, the, which requires the scale to be correct. Okay. Um, equilibrium, I'll pass this. Um, but essentially, the system could have a single or up to three uh, equilibria. Um, it's kind of hard to get the three, but it requires, generally requires quite a bit of the informa individual information needs to be drowned out uh, by the social information. Uh, did a case study um, looking at bicycle ownership in the U.S. Um, here are some results. So essentially, so I found so this is a class membership, so the information function and social influence was significant. Um, and then individual information came from more educated people were more informed, whites were more informed, people with more vehicles were more informed, and regional factors became less prevalent in this model than the comparative model. Okay. Uh, this is the class membership. 
I mean, this is the choice model. So this is more informed class and less informed class. So um, the less informed people were less sensitive to household composition, and uh, they, right. And then the more informed class, they were less sensitive to renting and home footprints, and less sensitive to being in a single household, single, single person household, or in, in their income. Okay. So this was actually the. Um, this is like the hypothesis is that like uh, if you're in a more informed class, you should have a higher probability of choosing, right? Um, and this, I didn't force this in the model, but uh, in our estimations, it actually worked out that the, the below more, more informed class was always uh, had a higher probability of choosing than the less informed class. Okay. Uh, so concluding, I generalize. So uh, you can use this to evaluate um, information campaigns and concentrate on low information populations. Um, it's also a more general class of like social effects induced random taste variation. Um, and this is like an example of trying to extend it to more classes, um, as well as you could also extend it to changes in preferences and changes of beliefs. So you could change the choice set depending on which class they're in, right? Um, well, that'd be constraint change, right? Um, and then um, work, this is kind of what I'm currently doing, right? Oh, you could also have their X's change from class to class as they get more information. So I'll return to what I said right in the beginning. So this is what I hope you remember. Everything else is cool, but this is the most important part. Okay. We have time for one or two questions. I'm not as familiar with this area as I'd like to be, but I'm, I'm, we, we, a lot of talk recently about trying to do more interdisciplinary research, and can you give a little bit of a background on which other disciplines or papers or, or things that were sort of outside economics or, or tra traditional travel behavior that you might have pulled in? Can you know, give us some ideas about, you, you had a sociologist on your committee, for example, and. Mm -hmm. And so what kinds of interesting other disciplines uh, might have, you might have referred to or read papers in that would help you with, with um, formulating this kind of work? Um, so I, I had that general question from my committee that they were like, why, um, what are different other models that could be used? Um, so I did have a, an appendix that kind of went over um, what models are used uh, more in like st the statistics of, so of uh, social networks. Um, so, a lot of stuff like, like ergoms and um, there are these other dynamic models of network formation as well as, uh, let's see. Um, I kind of started actually with uh, identity economics is where I started from and then kind of got more and generalized it more and more. So that's where I kind of got interested. Um, so I, I saw a lot about from soci social psychology and, soci and also sociology. So mo mostly those, those areas. So we thank again, Michael.